Hi, I'm Terry from Being Heard. Welcome to Holistic and Practical Solution for Alzheimer's Caregivers and Alzheimer's Patients. And this is the first video, and it's just an introduction and overview of Alzheimer's itself. I'd like to start itself. with the interesting fact that the healthy brain has 86 billion neurons. And while there aren't any actual statistics as to what the decrease is in the Alzheimer's brain, it's very clear on examination the diminished capacity and size of the Alzheimer's brain to the healthy brain. And the statistics in this country are staggering. They really are mind-boggling. There are about 5.2 million Americans with Alzheimer's or dementia, and it is the sixth leading cause of death. One in three seniors suffers from an Alzheimer's or dementia. And the cost is $203 billion U.S. annually. That's staggering and mind-boggling. And I want to now talk about a brief overview or description. And the three basic elements that comprise Alzheimer's and or dementia is the buildup of amyloid plaques outside the neurons of the brain. And they clump together almost like um, the plaque in arterial, you know, arteries. And it interferes with the neurons ability to send information from one to the other because the plaques get in the way and are interference. And there are, to get this exactly right, because I would refer to them as fibers, but they're neurofibrillary tangles. And those form inside the neurons. So you have two neurons kind of together, and on you have amyloid plaques kind of interfering on the outside. But then inside the actual neuron itself, you have further interference and complications playing out. And then the third is the loss of connection between the neurons. Neurons fire together, tend to wire together. And when they have a harder time, they kind of separate and they lose that connection. Kind of like people you might have grown up with and you've lost touch with. It's just the connection is no longer there. You wouldn't know how to find them if you were really trying. Granted, in today's age of the internet, it's a little easier than it used to be, but still, I think you understand the kind of metaphor that I'm working with. And in the early stages of Alzheimer's, very often there's no outward symptoms. There's no detectable signs. And that's probably twofold. One, the, the onset, the damage is minimal and the brain is very flexible. But also, I suspect that individuals build coping mechanisms where you might ask a question and they'll answer it, but you might not realize they're answering it with a little less specificity. Did you like that book? Oh, yes, it was very good. And yet, if you ask them about the book, they might not be able to tell you. So I suspect there's a combination of a roller coaster effect where in the early stages, the damage and the impact isn't as severe and the brain can still compensate. And second, where the brain can't actually compensate for information, it learns to compensate in its interactions. And that's a social survival skill. I mean, that's not something that's being devious. It's the brain doing its best to make sense of what's going on around it and have logical, coherent interactions. In the later stages, there is clear damage to the hippocampus, which is essential for the formation of memories and intellectual functioning. And interestingly, you can see that there's signs of decreased size in the Alzheimer's brain, and yet also there is signs of inflammation. So it's kind of an interesting interplay of two different things taking place, both of which interfere with the brain's optimal functioning. In working with Alzheimer's patients and working as a caregiver with Alzheimer's patients, 
I sometimes wonder, and I can't quite tell, if the information actually isn't there or it's a retrieval mechanism. That are they struggling to get the information out or are they struggling because they can't find the information um, that you asked them. For example, if you were to say, give me the red book or give me the red shirt, um, are they unable to comprehend what you asked or are they unable to connect the dots to perform the function or to respond? Did you like that? That's an easy question to answer because they can give just agreement. Oh yes, I did or no, or you know, those rote kind of responses that people tend to give can be very subtly deceptive to know what's going on and how much the brain is really processing. So it's really important to learn how to ask questions that aren't leading questions, but that can determine whether or not there really is comprehension and whether or not the answers you're getting really do convey the fact that they understood and that there's data retrieval. And so from what I've seen in working with Alzheimer's patients and clients and caregivers is it's interesting that I often see similarities in behavior, not necessarily disease, but behavior of ADD, ADHD, or OCD in terms of their inability to hold attention or their inability to just sit still. It's dinner time, sit at the table, and all of a sudden they just can't. They've maxed out their capacity to stay clear and focused. The brain needs to refresh. It needs to do something. And it's almost like, like I said, ADHD, where the neurons are firing, but it's random. They can't connect. And so the brain is kind of in hyperdrive trying to do something, but it doesn't know what. And so it just goes into action. It goes into motion. And that often can be offset with other support mechanisms, but it's a really good indicator of a level of frustration or a level of cognitive connection. And it's interesting because there are other times that as much as the patient doesn't always seem to have clarity of thought and cognition, sometimes they can grasp on something and maintain a focus like an OCD. There was one time I was taking care of a woman and we were coming into the house and there was a piece of paper on the ground that she picked up and I took it from her and said, oh, don't worry, that's nothing. And I put it on the chair outside. And for the next hour to hour and a half, she kept trying to go outside, which was a little unusual, but not unheard of. And it was baffling because there was this absolute determination to turn around and like a, like a shot, she was back at the door, back at the door. And I finally made the connection, and when I got the piece of paper and gave it to her, it was like this sigh of relief. <sighs> and whatever was incomplete was satisfied. So for whatever reason, she had determined that piece of paper must be important and was able to hold on to that. Even though she didn't have the cognitive capacity to say, I want the paper, or I need the paper, or can you get the paper, the brain held on to that. It was really interesting. And I think there's probably a lot of times that you may well see with an Alzheimer's patient or a family member, something that's very similar. So it's really important when you see a behavior that kind of raises that kind of red flag of what's going on to try and backtrack and deduce what they may be trying to accomplish. Because once you can satisfy that, they de-escalate, which is a lot easier for them and for you. So what we're going to cover in this series and what you're going to learn are how to make dietary changes that can minimize the stressful behavior for both, like I said, the patient and the caregiver and things that can optimize both clarity and cooperation. It's very frustrating for both caregiver and patient when that connect can't happen, when the brain is struggling to accomplish what you ask it, or it doesn't understand that comprehension. 
And some of that can be done with diet, nutrition, and detoxing, and we'll go over that in very specific detail in that chapter. Vitamins and minerals that can support brain function, minimize stress, and optimize cognitive function. And then function. we're going to look at the role and benefit of exercise and activities and exercises and suggestions for implementing them. One of the things I found is very often is they're in that kind of a mode because they're not being exercised enough to really get tired. And the sleep and waking cycles can really get thrown off. And when you combine that with poor diet and nutrition, which with all of the best intents, people don't always understand that there are things that are not beneficial for the challenged brain, for the challenged body. And when you make these minor adjustments, you'll find that a lot of the stress on both sides of the equation are minimized. So our first video in this training series is going to look at basic diet and nutrition with suggestions to implement and changes to make, things to include, things to remove. And you'll find that their health and well-being is really improved a lot just by making these kinds of simple changes. So stay tuned and click on to the next video and I'll see you there.